Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. We have with us today in our studio, Mrs. Blown for Good herself, Claire Headley. Claire, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on. Oh, we're looking forward to it. Uh, Claire, I make fun on my blog. I use a tagline, OT8 is great, where I say we in RTC. But you are actually RTC. Yes, I was. And according to court documents filed by the church, you were the third ranking person in RTC? That, that's correct. I was um, internal exec was my position. And so I was uh, directly under Marty for many years. Um, but more specifically, Shelley Miscavige ran me personally for um, the entire time I was on that post, which was from 2000 until... September of 2004, and I was in RTC from, um, let's see, from March of 96 until September 2004. That is amazing. Let's talk about uh, your interactions with Shelly Miscavige. What kind of person is she? Uh, you know, what sort of orders would she give? Um, Shelly, so Shelly ran me, obviously, on internal related matters, more relating to the staff and uh, training of the staff, sec checking of the staff. Um, you know, some people didn't like Shelley. Mm -hmm. I thought Shelley was a, a really well-intended person. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think she, I think she was in a very tough spot from what I observed. You know, she was trying to keep a psychopath under control and struggling to do that. That's just, you know, what I saw and what I experienced and what she said to me, that, that was my impression. I think she was a very, some, somebody through and through loyal to L. Ron Hubbard from having worked with him. She talked about that many, many, many times in conversations we had. Um, but I know she was extremely concerned about David Miscavige. At certain points, she thought he was going to go... Uh, psychotic or had already gone psychotic she thought he was going to blow at one point um, you know she had gone to great lengths to try and get him um, in for sec checking and auditing and he fought that tooth and claw the whole time I mean I knew I knew about that from 1997 forward she was desperately trying to get him um, help and she was and every time she tried to get him help, he fought her fiercely. Is it would it be correct to say that David Miscavige does not want to be audited? Oh, absolutely. He hasn't. He has not been audited since 1993. Who? That's shocking uh, for a Scientologist. Who? Do you know the last person to audit him was? Yes, it was. Well, I know one of two people, Ray Midoff and John Eastman were the last two people to to audit him and he had been on OT7 and in 1993 he broke his foot and he had some review auditing and thereafter he did not resume either solo or form, formal you know regular auditing so he was on OT7 well that certainly answers one of the you know the questions uh, that people had about his case level, so-called case level. So Shelley Miscavige is caught between a rock and a hard place, yes. as you describe it. Now, what are the events that lead to her downfall? Well, a number of things. Um, more and more uh, Miscavige from, I mean, really the whole time I was there, the, the punishments became more and more and more extreme, uh, you know, in the in the early 2000s leading up to when I escaped from there um, it had gotten so extreme like you know he had he often had people running laps around buildings he had all event management cleaning out human feces from the aeration ponds as is covered in Mark's book um, you know he had them scrubbing toilets with tooth toothbrushes uh, you know he had gone to extreme levels to humiliate, um, you know, all of top management, basically. He'd stripped, everybody on the base had been stripped of rank, uh, except for him, of course. Um, and, you know, all of this, it was all, it was always 
stated as, oh, he's trying to impinge and he's trying to, uh, you know, have them make ethics change. But really, in the bottom line is it was him absolutely running psychopathic control. Um, in, I think it was 2001 or 2002, I'll, I'll never forget, there was a, we, myself, Warren McShane, uh, Fleur Thomas, that's Larissa's sister, um, we were, and Marty, we were all the executive counsel of RTC, and Miscavige called us up to his office and was going off on Warren about some legal case that he'd screwed up, and um, he had <clears throat> Fleur and myself, Fleur was, you know, she was slender, small woman, and and as was I, and he had both of us um, stand in front of him, and he grabbed he uh, he grabbed the back of our pants and had us drag him across the room. And the whole point was a demonstration of how we're his you know chains and shackle and chains, basically holding him back from all these amazing miraculous things that he's quote unquote working on doing. And it's one of those moments where you're like. Really, I've given my whole life, and I've friggin' worked insane hours for no nothing. I have no relationship with my family. I can't talk to anybody. I have no life of my own, and all of this. So you can tell me that I'm stopping the head guy. I mean, really, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> anyway, oh, it's, oh, that, that that's insane that he would he, he would uh, dramatize in that way. And uh, Claire, this is the difference between uh, two things I see with Miscavige. Uh, there's a there is a crucial difference between leadership and domination. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and, and I and I know this from working a long time in corporate. Uh, a leader inspires, directs, guides, and and can you know be a firm disciplinarian. Hey, you know, pick up the pace here. Right. Uh, correct this. Do that. Miscavige is into domination and not leadership. Yes, absolutely. And, and I don't. And I yeah. I completely agree with you. And I think that in addition to that. There's the factor that power can do funny things to people. It can either, you know, lead them to greatness or it can lead them to utter evilness. And that's what's happened with him. He's come into a position of power and, you know, he has turned that power into something completely ugly and evil. When he was given that power out of compassion of people wanting to help through Scientology. Whether whether it helps or not doesn't matter. The intention, I you know, I know there's a lot of good people who have been in Scientology, and all they ever wanted to do, myself included, was to help people. Well, that's well said. Power you, it could lead you to greatness, or it can lead you to complete and utter corruption and and rottenness, as as has happened with David Miscavige. That's right. Claire, when did you first meet David Miscavige? Um, I first met him in 1991 when I arrived to the to the base there in Hemet. So if he was born in 1960, you met him when he was 31 years old. That's right. And, I, and how old? I was 16 at the time. So you were a 16 year old teenage girl, right? Meeting a 31 year old leader of a religion. Did you hold him in high esteem when you initially arrived at the base? Um, I did. I mean, I would say. You know, ironically, it was always, um, it was not necessarily esteem so much as fear and intimidation. Mm. Um, you know, because it's, you know, and that's a, that's kind of a difficult question for me. And I think it has to do with the fact that I grew up in Scientology. Uh, you know, it was always like significances that other people gave these these powerful people, not that I necessarily observed to be the case. Like, in other words, it's not that he was somebody that I had seen do great things. It was just somebody that I was now supposed to, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir. <laughs> Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, that's a point well taken because uh, sometimes when you, you are around someone with a great deal of power, you do have a sense of fear. And especially, I, I don't think... Uh, Maybe people haven't been in the Church of Scientology can appreciate how David Miscavige can utterly ruin your life at a whim. Absolutely. I know that. And that was so. So when I first met him, just to give a bit of background, which will elaborate on that completely, 
is um, so when I first arrived to the imp base, I was positioned in the qualifications division. So that's you know staff training, staff processing, um, and so forth. And um, and I was on the, the the team that delivered the key to life and life orientation courses. Um, so I started on that in I think September '91. Shortly thereafter. Ted Horner blew the Sea Org, um, and anytime anybody blew the Sea Org, there was going to be a head on a pike, and somebody was going to be blamed for the reason that person escaped. So in this case, Miscavige decided that the head on the pike was the entire qualifications division, and the entire division was shut down, and we were put on a schedule of... It, there was a mission sent in that had Dan Kuhn on it, ironically. Dan Kuhn, Sue Kuhn, and a couple of other people. And the entire qualifications division was now going to redo all of their TRs from the bottom up. And nobody was allowed to do any work while this was happening. We were on a schedule that was 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. at night, 10-minute meal breaks. If we were late for any muster once, we'd go in the lake. We were late twice. We'd go to the RPF. Uh, You know, it was pretty extreme. And as a 16-year-old girl at the time, I was convinced my life was over. I was like, there's no way I was going to make it through this. And the only reason I did is because Mark told me, you know, buckle up, get through it. You'll be fine. You're going to make it. Uh, He's the only reason I didn't fold instantly. Um, But so this was at the direct orders of, David Miscavige, and he would frequently come through and do inspections while we were on this program. And I saw firsthand that somebody would just look at him wrong and they would be out of there on, you know, heavy manual labor, uh, extreme punishments, just because they looked at him wrong. And, you know. Is this the so called face crime? Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, I can tell you the, about the whole campaign, the pie face campaign that he ran later. That, that's a whole oh. other story. Oh, no, please go into jump, from, jump into pie face. I'd like to. So, so I, <laughs> and it, it's laughable, really. I mean, if it weren't so ridiculous and if it didn't, hadn't impacted so many people's lives, it would be just a funny joke. Uh, but Claire, let me let me interject. This is exactly why the word tragic comedy exists. That's true. The Church of Scient- yeah. yeah, the Church of Scientology is tragic, and yet there's comedic aspects. So it's a tragic comedy, and sometimes you laugh so that you don't cry. That's right, exactly. Because what else can you do if you cannot laugh? What else can you do? What shoot yourself in the head? You know? Yeah, it's, cry. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So pie face, and I I was at the meeting where that that campaign was born and literally Miscavige came in and he always, you know, Luis would come in beforehand and set up his special waters and set up his special protein bars and set up his ashtray and set up the recorders and clear the whole room and shut all the doors and make sure all the right people were there that was supposed to be there. Um, <clears throat> Claire, Claire, let me jump in just for our uh, listeners who may, who may not know Clarice I'm sorry, Larice. Uh, who is Larice? Her role as a communicator, so people know, you know, who works closely with David Miscavige. I'm sorry, I missed the question. Oh, it's okay. Uh, you said that is it was it Clarice or Larice that came oh, in? Oh, it was Larice. Larice Stukenbrock, okay. his communicator. Okay. Now, what is her role as his communicator? Uh, she was essentially his, you know. Uh, she was with him 24/7 day and night she would record all his meetings run 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 all of his personal staff um i mean she was with him every second every waking minute of every day okay so part, as part of his entourage Larice was there and, and let's go back to the the meeting where pie face the pie face campaign started yes so there was a catch-22 at the base, which was that if you responded to Miscavige in a meeting, there was a 50-50 chance, depending on the day, the time, and his mood, that you would end up on heavy manual labor or some other dramatic thing would happen. So by natural uh, <laughs> evolution, 
um, what happened is people stopped talking at the meetings and um, because they didn't want to be the person in the hot seat. And so and that would that would equally drive Miscavige into fits of rage. You know, he would just go apoplectic purple and and say how this was an evil thing being done to him to drive him crazy is that nobody would say anything. Well, knowing the history on it, it wasn't any great surprise to me. I mean, I certainly knew that <laughs> I, I'd been to hundreds of meetings with him and seen what, what happened when people would answer. Uh, anyway, he was at this meeting and he had a, a, you know, a whiteboard up and he drew a picture of a face. It was just a circle with a line, a flat line for an eye for each eye and a flat line for the mouth and he called it pie face and um you know then it became this this whole campaign on the base of you know badges were made and posters were made and you know it was like oh let's stop the pie face that's going on and really ironically when marty blew uh when he made his escape it was all blamed on him which is just insane but whatever it is this is this is hard to get. Let, let, let me back up a few steps. So, yes. you you're in a catch twenty two. If you talk, David Miscavige will rip your head off. Right. If you don't talk, you're pie face. Right. And so you're not in a very tenable position. No. He, do you, no, and, and, and it, you, it was a known fact at the base. The higher up you go, the the, the greater your chances are. You're eventually going to fall. Um, it was just a matter of time. I mean, it had happened to everybody, everybody. And some new person would come in, and this would be David Miscavige carting them around like they're the new, you know, BMOC, as he called it. Um, Which means big man on campus. That's right, exactly. And and then the re- everybody else would be like, you know, in the back of their heads, they're going, okay, we'll see how long this lasts. You know, Debbie Cook was a great example of that. She was brought in as the big, great white hope, Russ Bellin, Tom DeVocht, you know. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. It was a re- repeating pattern for years. Um, and it, it would, was just a matter of time before <laughs> he no longer, Miscavige no longer liked what they were saying or whatever. The pressure got to them. And... Then they- then, now this this is uh, this is interesting. It, it, it's not an unknown phenomenon in, in corporate life. Sometimes you would bring in, you know, this is the new man or woman who's going to turn the corporation around. Yes. And uh, people like me, you know, beneath that strata, uh, as a regional manager, so I think, oh, give them six months, they'll be out. They don't turn it around. Right. So there's there's always hope on the part of uh, irrational CEOs, COBs, leaders like that, that there's going to be some miracle turnaround artist. Every once in a while, you get someone who can really turn around a company, but they're usually in short term for the money and their turnaround, you know, experts. Uh, anyway, you mentioned that uh, Marty Rathbun blew. Yes. What what happens when someone of his rank, literally the number two guy, escapes? Uh, what is the fallout from that on the base for those of you left behind? It was it was devastating. I mean, ironically, I was the last person Marty talked to before he escaped because uh, I was his direct junior as internal executive. And um, he had been going to these very intense meetings uh, where Miscavige was, you know, had stripped all, had thrown RTC into the mix of you guys are all shitheads, basically. Excuse my language, but... Uh, no, no, I <laughs> <laughs> you can't talk about Miscavige without your language going rotten, unfortunately. Um, anyway, and and he was under a lot of pressure um, and basically being, you know, being told that he was, you know, the who for the whole base and which really, what does that even mean? Um, but either way, he'd been in meetings just day in and day out. Miscavige was, would run the meetings all the way through the night. And I mean, literally like the meetings would end at four or five o'clock in the morning. He would go sleep. Everybody else would get a a half an hour, maybe an hour of sleep and have to be back on post until the meeting started again when Miscavige got up, which was of course eight hours later. Um, So it was around six, six or seven o'clock at night. And Marty had gotten the call from Larice that he was to head down, um, 
to the, uh, the south side of the property to go to the meeting with Miscavige. He walked through my office and he said, okay, I'm heading down to the meeting. And we talked briefly and then he left. And about an hour later, you know, I had one of the RTC Nextel phone slash radios. Yeah. And about an hour later, my my radio goes off and it's Cerise. And she says, where's Marty? And the second she asked, I knew. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> uh, you know, because Marty had blown before in 93. And um, anyway, so then... Larissa's is calling. Shelly starts calling. Um, about an hour later, it was very obvious that he was long gone. And and then the whole drill started of, you know, activating security. They went through the footage. They found where he'd snuck out the gate on his motorcycle. Um, what was amazing to me, though, was, you know, the drill went in full, full force. I mean, he... They were going to find now Marty that, no matter what. This is the blow drill. Yes. Blow when, drill. when somebody, for our listeners who may not know, blowing is escaping from Scientology. You blow. You make uh, it's a, an unauthorized departure. Exactly. What they say is an unauthorized departure. Mm-hmm. So you go, you leave of your own free will. That's an unauthorized departure unless you have written authorization mm-hmm. to leave for a very specific purpose. So Marty has escaped, as he's written about. It's very riveting. Yes. He's escaped on his motorcycle. Miscavige must be somewhere between terrified, panicked, and uh, extremely angry. What, what's Miscavige's reaction to Marty l- blowing? Oh, he flipped out. I mean, I will say this. You know, there's many crazy things that Miscavige has said, and the one thing that he always said that I never understood until I left is he always said, you, you don't, you guys, what you guys don't understand is that you make security threats. Um, You turn everything into a security threat. And I never understood what he meant at all until I left. (laughs) And I realized, well, yeah, anybody that was close to Miscavige is a security threat. Not only a security threat to Miscavige, but a security threat to Scientology because they have firsthand uh, views and knowledge of what's really going on behind the scenes in Scientology and how really crazy Miscavige is. And that's what he never wanted. That's why he was so psychotic about not letting anyone leave who had been close to him. But look at the general setup, Claire. Yeah. He, he himself, Miscavige, is engaging in atrocious, inexcusable conduct. He is physically violent, assaulting people. Yes. And he is, of course, worried about that details of this will get out to the outside world. That's right. Claire, I, re- I remember uh, a, p- a party where uh, I met you and Mark. It was at uh, Castaic Lake. Yes, the first SP, and- real SP party. Yes, and and uh, what year was that? I that was. Uh, um, hang on a minute, I'll repeat. Twenty ten. I think it was two thousand nine. Yeah, it was two thousand nine, mid two thousand nine. Okay, so yeah, and I remember the party. Uh, Jason Begay was there. Yes. As was Larry Anderson. Yes, that's right. Jenna Miscavige Hill was there. Yes. And I remember saying to Jenna, Jenna. What must your uncle David Miscavige be thinking about all this intensely negative PR on him out there? And she said he's freaking out. All he cares about is his personal PR. That's right. So when Miscavige does these contradictory things, doesn't it occur to him that that word will get out? Or does he think he can hold everyone captive there and that he can keep a lid on it? You know, honestly, I think it's gotten beyond... It defies logic at this point. Like, you you and I might try to figure out why it makes sense what he's doing. But really, the bottom line is that's where he is a psychopath. Uh, there is no rhyme or reason, no logic, no nothing. It's, you know, um, self-protection, self, you know, self-empowerment. He He is the center of his world, and he will do anything and everything to keep it that way. One thing I want to cover uh, is the topic of David Miscavige and money, yes. Church of Scientology and money. Yes. 
Marty Rathbun has said that one thing uh, Ms. Gavage looks at in the morning is who blew. Yes, that's right. There's a secu- Security would do a report every single day. So were uh, people blowing, it was common enough to where he had to ask every morning. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And there was there were plenty of time periods where, I mean, there were some days that multiple people blew. This is just insane. How can you run a company, you know? How can you run a company with people uh, quitting? Right, yeah. That, that, and not, that, that's called, exactly. That's called high, yeah, high turnover. That's right. High, high turnover is horrible for a company. Yeah. So of high turnover. Now, after getting the report on who blew, how many, did he next look at finances? Um, I think the next thing he would look at is the the uh, press updates. From For Oza. himself in the church? That's right. And Yeah, exactly. And he, fo- he put his entire focus on uh, anything, getting every, anything negative about him removed, not Hubbard. It was only about his focus was entirely on getting the negative publicity on him attacked and dealt with. Okay, so over morning coffee, David Miscavige first asks, who blew? Yep. And that needs to be handled because they might have damaging details on him. Yep, especially the if, second they were, thing, if they were at a meeting the night before, which commonly happened. So the second thing after who blew is press updates from the Office of Special Affairs. That's right. Uh, and Miscavige wants to know what was said about me out on the internet or in the media. That's right. And can we get it removed? That's right. Uh, this is astonishing that he would, do you think he reads the boards or does he get a summary of things from Tony Ortega or? I, I mean, I think he does. I really do. I mean, I, I don't think, um, and I know for sure he gets summaries, but I think he also looks at stuff. Because so he, can't, the, uh, he can't stop himself. You know, like it, any normal person would be like, whatever, I don't care. Like, hey, we've got to, you know, we've got people to help. Let's focus on, you know, you know, if we really if we really do have an answer that's going to change the world irrevocably, then let's focus on that. Not like, oh, what's, you know, Joe, Bl- what's Mark Headley who left in 2006? What's he doing? <laughs> like, really? You have nothing better to worry about than friggin' asking somebody who's just trying to get on with their life. I mean, that's what made Mark blow for good. That's what turned. That's what made him start posting because they would not, would not leave us alone. Yeah, and Claire, that's one of the characteristics of the uh, Scientology that's really uh, demented. Is if you just want to leave. Yes. They won't leave you alone after you leave. That's right. You know, I, I grew up in the uh, Assemblies of God. Okay. And I was going to Vanguard University in Southern California. I was studying to be a minister. And my plan was to go to Fuller Seminary. And then I lost my faith at age 21. Okay. So it was honest for me to just leave the church. Yeah. And when I, le- when I left the church, of which I've been a longtime member, nobody stalked or harassed me. Right. They just said, we'll pray for you. We hope you come back around to the faith. Right. But, you know, best of luck in your new life. So they were very gracious. Yes. Scientology will not leave you alone. At your level, where uh, you and Mark were, David Miscavige has it out for you. Absolutely. And, and you know, I've co- I covered in my deposition many times, and I've said it before, too. Shelley Miscavige told me on numerous occasions, once you're in RTC, and these were her words, not mine, you've forgone your right to leave. And I observed that to be true. They tracked anybody that blew from RTC down viciously, you know, and thoroughly and dragged them back. I mean, they, they caught Sue Wilhair, Sue Pichet in South Africa for crying out loud and got her back. Is it fair to say that RTC is the inner circle? Um, no, I would, I think, I think, okay, so I think it's, envisioned that way but really the inner circle is david miscavige's office and and that's what is what's what's it called office of cob yeah yeah and whoever is currently in his entourage that's really the inner circle i mean i know i considered rtc to be the inner circle and that's where you know honestly as a struggling staff member on the ant base i was like well maybe if i'm in rtc i'll be better off and sadly i had that very very wrong but 
um, that's how I saw it when I was, you know, a little supervisor in Cole Gold. I was like, well, you know, where else are you going to move than up? And that's how I ended up in RTC. Um, and then when I was in RTC, I was like, wow, shit, I really, really got this wrong. I mean, one of the first meetings I was at when I was in RTC was in Clearwater, and we were standing in, you know, spring heat in Florida in full-on SO Seorg Class A uniform for eight hours while Miscavige came in and out rave, ranting and raving because his computer had been hacked. Had it actually been hacked? Well, yeah, that was the whole Incom plant situation um, where his emails were being read by somebody in Incom. And so the whole church comes to a grinding halt. Oh, yeah. I mean, RTC was in lower conditions, and it was, you know, he was absolutely in a screaming rage about that. Um. And I, and, I, and I don't even know all the inner details of that. I know, you know, the whole, the, I know the guy, the guy's name was Tom Rummelhart, and they, there there were mission after mission after mission, and that guy was locked up for probably eight years, maybe more, getting sec checked daily by RTC, just because he read some of David Miscavige's emails. That is shocking. Yeah. Claire, going back to morning coffee with uh, David Miscavige, so he looks at Hublu. Yes. The OSA press updates on him. What comes next? Is it like the church finance, yes. the bottom line much, money? Yeah, how much money Flag made um, and how much uh, how much money is in the I, IAS war chests, as he calls them. Um, yeah, the money. And this, this leads into an interesting question. Now, uh, I posted the IRS 990T filings that the church is, is required to file. Yes. The book value of Church's Spiritual Technology uh, flag service organization and Church of Scientology International is $1.5 billion. Mm-hmm. And that's the money we know about. Right. The, the uh, IES we don't know about. The SIRT, the Scientology International Reserve Trust, we don't know about, nor do we know about the Church of Scientology Religious Trust. How does, from your view at the level of RTC, did you know how money moved up lines or what happens when a parishioner donates $100,000 to the IES? Um, well, I knew that the IES money was very separate to uh, management operations and organization and would only be... Uh, like Miscavige had to authorize use of the IES money for, you know, what he called grants um, that had to be specifically approved by him. So, it, you know, he was the only person that knew. He is the only person that I knew of that knew exactly how much money was where, and he would make vague references to it. Um, you know, like in other words, he'd say, "Oh, IES has." however many billions of dollars it was and i knew that there were that there was 30 million in rtc reserves because we hit that during the time that i was the internal exec and it was this, one of my statistics was rtc reserves so these are pools of cash you can spend now now going over to um and we're going to jump around a little bit here okay uh so he looks at the money there was a year where he wanted a new BMW. Yes. David Miscavige wanted a new BMW. What went on, and how was the church able to get him the new BMW he wanted? So that was, as I recall, I believe, December 2002 or 2003. Um, and and I found out about it after the fact, because I had to check the ASI staff that were involved. Uh, now, a a ASI is Author Services International. Could you tell our listeners what ASI does? Yes, yeah, so they are um, essentially the royalties organization for the author, meaning L. Ron Hubbard. Um, and so they managed uh, his fiction and nonfiction works royal and the royalties from those. Um, so they were they worked very closely with Bridge Publications. And um, and they dealt with all his fiction works. They were very involved in the production of Battlefield Earth, for example. Um, and 
And it's important to state, Claire, um, it's important to state so that people understand, in one sense, this is just in one sense, the entire Church of Scientology, all organizations, whether they're social betterment, is set up so that the author is paid royalties. Yes, that is correct. Even though L. Ron Hubbard is, has, has died in 1986, he must be paid royalties. That's right, and, and actually that's a really good point to bring up because that had a lot to do with why uh, David Miscavige was so fiercely working on revising the books because it tied in with the copyrights. And the copyrights, as I recall, I mean, don't, this is, was not my expertise. I'm just letting you know the impression I had from being around it. Fair and enough. pieces that I heard. But but as I recall, there was a, a deadline coming up that was uh it was either it was there was a certain number of years and I think it was ten that it, ten years after the author dies that can no longer get royalties unless the book is revised and changed and whatever and then the copyright is renewed. Correct. So so, the, like the 1991 release of the 100% on source tech books, that's part of it? Yes, exactly. So, and, and that's part of the rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. And it had to be a significant, you know, change. Not, not just like, oh, we crossed the I, or, you know, we crossed the T and we dotted the I. Um, and I, you know, it didn't mean anything to me at the time because I was just, you know, a uh, <laughs> a non-thinking zombie trying to make it through the, the next day, um, trying to not end up on heavy manual labor. I mean, you know, I'm just being honest. It was I didn't have sure. any big picture at all when I was working there, even when I was internal exec. You know, that's why to me it's a joke. Yes, there the Scientology lawyers said, "Oh, you were number three in command," and I was like, "Well, okay." <laughs> on paper, sure, yeah, I was. Did that mean that I had any? power or say or anything absolutely not that was miscavige's show through and through and and that just to to add here david miscavige is the captain of the sea organization yes and he runs the entire church absolutely yes and his lawyers in in como county texas in the monique rathlin case are trying to argue that he derives no authority whatsoever from the sea org that his rank is honorary right which is just the biggest bunch of baloney anyone's ever heard. I mean, if obviously they're just rattling back what they've been told, and that's absolutely so far from reality, it's not even funny. Claire, that's really something uh, for David Miscavige to deny that he does not run the Church of Scientology uh, when he quite obviously does run the church. What we're going to do now is uh, end part one of our very interesting interview with Claire Headley. We invite our listeners to listen to part two, which will be up on the Internet very soon. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is Jeffrey Augustine, and as always, we will be in very good touch. Thank you for listening.